Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dad Vice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is video number, believe it or not, 90 in my journey from kidney failure to kidney great. This is also day four of Dad Vice TV's Kidney Health Week, broadcasting live every single day, August 1st through August 7th, to help you kick kidney disease to the curb with all sorts of great information. Now, let me real quickly bring up the schedule for the rest of the week in case you're like, hey, I want to catch some of the other shows. Here's what we got coming up. So today is August 4th. We got Jen Hernandez, our favorite renal dietitian, sharing so much great information here with us. We have a, a doctor, a, nef a nephrologist tomorrow to talk about Pro Renal Plus D and renal multivitamins and why you just can't run out to CVS or Walmart and grab some multivitamin off the shelf, why you need to be careful which, which one you're using. Then after that, we have Kibo Biotech, the makers of Renadil, a renal uh, probiotic to help you in your gut. And it has shown benefits for kidney patients. I used it, got my labs, and it had great results for me. It's a great addition to a fantastic diet. And then wrapping up Dad Vice TV's Kidney Health Week, we have Sarah Bitter, a very awesome person, a friend of mine, who is gonna talk about healthcare for kidney patients. We're gonna talk about how we can influence policy being made around healthcare, how we can make sure that we're gonna be covered when we need it, and how we can try to get uh, things like uh, phosphorus listed on food labels. We're gonna to talk to her about that and so much other cool stuff. So that is what we have coming up for the rest of this week with Dad Vice TV's Kidney Health Week. Now, if you are brand new and you don't know who the heck I am, let me give you a very brief introduction. My name is James. I was diagnosed almost two years ago with stage five kidney failure. My original, my very first GFR when I was went to the ER was eight. They got me up to 13. They said, that's as good as you're gonna get. I worked with my doctor. I worked with renal dietitians. And today, my last GFR, 33, not a single symptom. I feel wonderful. With us, we also have, let me bring her up here, renal dietitian, Jen Hernandez. And a renal dietitian is the most important part, in my opinion, of your battle against kidney disease. So Jen, I'll let you introduce yourself real quick for those that are new. Thanks, James. So I am a renal dietitian. I'm a registered dietitian. I've gone through testing and internship schooling to become a dietitian. And then I decided it wasn't enough. I needed more. So I went through more education, more experience, more testing to become a board certified renal dietitian. And what I do today and uh, for the majority of my work is helping people with kidney disease take care of their kidney health so that they do not have to go to dialysis. I work with people in all different stages, working privately one-on-one -on -one with those living in the United States. And I also work with people in the, in the United States and internationally in my group program, Plant Powered Kidneys. That is what I do every day and I love it. And I am so always, always so happy to be here on the show talking with you, James, and everybody that is following us as well. So today is no different. Very excited for the conversation that we are going to be having. Yep. And for those of you, if you are not a subscriber to Dad Vice TV, please go to YouTube and subscribe. We are at 86,000 subscribers, and I would love wow. to hit 100,000, because then YouTube sends me a little plaque with a little silver play button, and that would look really awesome. Also, Jen runs a free Facebook group called Plant Powered Kidneys. Make sure you, just, you go in there and you join it. Um, she asked a couple questions, they're really easy. She cooks, makes videos, does all sorts of great stuff. And the community in there is awesome, helping each other. And the community has really grown. You were just telling me it's over a thousand or almost a thousand now? We're Yeah, we're over a thousand people in the group. And yeah, you were totally right. This community is so awesome. Everybody is really supportive, very protective of one another. 
So uh, I do moderate and I keep an eye on everything going on in the group as best I can. But everyone is really, really protective of each other. And uh, if somebody gets slips through the cracks and gets through, everyone's really great to be like, hey, that's not okay. Um, but that really rarely ever happens. Everybody's just so supportive and encouraging and really love sharing how they're taking care of their kidneys. So it's very, very inspiring. And I'm so honored to have been able to bring up this platform for, for people to join. And I, I don't think there's, there's tons of very positive uh, kidney group platforms out mm -hmm. there. So I'm really honored that we do have one. Yeah. Now today, guys, we're going to be on a pretty tight timeline because Jen, it's lunchtime for her and she has an appointment at the top of the hour. So we are going to try to get to things really, really quick. Now, an important thing before we start today, we are going to be talking about labs, how to read and kind of understand your labs. What do all those different things mean? But one thing we can't do is analyze your individual labs. Now, I'll, I may bring up some of mine here just to show, hey, here's what it looks like. But we're really not going to dive into the numbers and the why the numbers are certain, certain ways they are, okay? Just want to make sure that's really clear. Now, if you have any comments, feel free. Join us in the live chat. Just remember, we can't answer specific questions uh, based on, on your, you know, your labs or your creatinine levels or anything like that. Those are best for your doctor or your renal dietitian. So let's go ahead and let's jump right on in. So Jen, let's, let's pretend I'm brand new. I just got diagnosed. What the heck are labs and why do I need them? So your labs are going to be a way to assess what's going on inside of your body especially related to your kidney health. Kidneys are doing a lot of things inside our bodies to manage and regulate a lot of different electrolytes, our pH balance, our red blood cell count, our blood pressure. A lot of stuff is going on in there. So the labs are going to give us a snapshot image of really what's happening inside, whether we know it or not, whether we feel it or not. So your doctor will be the one to determine the frequency of your lab draws. Mm -hmm. Uh, James, I know we've talked about this before that your doctor is really great about signing off for more frequent labs and some yep. doctors are really supportive. I can't say that we can assume that every single doctor is like that. They might have different uh, regulations or restrictions regarding insurance. That's always something that we have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So there are some rules in that case, but talk with your doctor about what your lab schedule should be so that you know when to routinely predict when those labs should be taken. Yeah, and those, and when I was at a lower GFR, you know, when I was kind of in the danger zone, my labs were a lot more frequently. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm stage three, I'm due for another set of labs. My last ones were from the beginning of January. Um, I was trying to get them every three months but with COVID. Yeah, I stayed home instead of making an extra trip because I feel great and I know exactly what I'm doing with my diet and how to stick with it and, you know, not get myself in trouble. All right, so um, let's go ahead and let's just dive right in. So the first one, the one that's probably the most uh, important, or at least it seems the most important to kidney patients, is they want to get their GFR, and that is on their renal function panel. So um, what the heck is the GFR? And you know, why is it important to us? And I'm pretending so, that I'm a brand new kidney okay. warrior. Okay, I know. Oh, I know. Yeah, James, you know all the stuff inside now. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to jump ahead and be like, okay, GFR this, boom, boom, and jump too fast. I want to kind of help the newbies. <laughs> so the GFR is gl the glomerular filtration rate. This is basically estimating how much of your blood is getting filtered by the kidneys. So it is going to be one of the first things that the doctors will typically look at when it comes to your kidney function. So it is, it's typically associated with the percentage. So a GFR over 90 or even sometimes 60 and above, it's, it's considered a normal functioning GFR. So it depends on a lot of factors, your age, your gender, uh, even your race, and also basically your creatinine level is very important to calculate that. So these factors will be determined to figure out what your GFR is. I will say that 
this again is a snapshot of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Having one GFR that looks off or funky or different is not enough to really give a solid diagnosis. And you might find that from your doctor, even if, um, if you think back to when you were first diagnosed that the doctor said, okay, let's recheck this, let's retest this. So they, they do check it several times and it is usually typically required to have it checked at least two or three times in a matter of a few months. They might even go to step further and do a kidney biopsy as well to further assess the function of your kidneys. So just looking at one GFR, is not going to say a whole lot per se, but looking at the trend is really what's going to tell us more information there. Yeah, and everyone should be aware your GFR, it will fluctuate a little bit and that's okay. perfectly normal. If it drops, you know, if I, like if I was a 36 and I went in and it was a 34, I'm not going to panic. That's normal. Now, if the next time it's a 32, then I might start getting concerned. But your GFR, it's going to fluctuate. It's those trends that we really need to look for. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as like how often or, or, or the ability to impact your GFR, when I first got mine, I actually was looking up some of my, my old data. Um, I actually had my, my, my GFR tested multiple times in the same day. Now, of course, I was on IVs and they were pumping stuff into me and you know, doing all sorts of stuff. And mine went from the eight to the 13 in like just two days with mm -hmm. the help of all that other stuff. Uh, so it can, in the right environment, kind of change a bit, um, hopefully for the better. Um, but it is just a snapshot, as you had mentioned. And a GFR, a lot of people I run into mistakenly think it measures damage, which is not what it measures. It's measuring, as you mentioned, creatinine, um, a waste product that's in our blood and that our kidneys normally can filter out. And they just have a scale. They know oh, if it's filtering this little bit of it, you know, and there's it's building up, this equates to this approximation of kidney function. So after that, we have another one that I, this is one I really got to work on. Your BUN or your um, blood urea nitrogen. What yes. is that one? So blood urea nitrogen is, uh, you might see it as urea nitrogen or BUN on your blood test results. And this is a measurement of essentially protein breakdown or metabolism in the body. So in general, looking at a BUN below 20 is what people typically tend to see, but it is often going to increase when there's kidney damage present because this is another waste that the kidneys are trying to deal with. And with kidney damage, the kidneys aren't able to take care of that waste as quickly as it could before. And that's when it starts to accumulate. So it can trend. I, I remember uh, working in dialysis and I would see the BUNs for my patients across the board would be upwards of 80, 90. It would be quite high. And that is considered at that point uh, sometimes more of a stability of, okay, we, we know it's not going to come down. So we're looking again at the trends. We're looking at the big picture of where it's going overall. Is it stable? Is it going up? Is it going down? What's happening there? So again, this is going to be a really recurring part of the conversation, I feel, but we're not just looking at one result. We need to look at the big picture. We need to look at the trend. And it's very much the case when it comes to something like BUN. Another thing to keep in mind is for BUN, because it's a breakdown of the protein metabolism, it is a little bit more directly related to diet influences. So yep. very, very often I have with my clients when we talk about going on a lower protein diet, which by the way, if you do follow a low protein diet, you need to be really, really careful about because it can lead to malnutrition and what's called protein energy wasting. So if it's not done carefully and safely, it can be harmful. So just to really put that out there really quickly, um, you really want to be careful with that, but a lower protein diet can help reduce BUN and can be protective of the kidneys. So that's why a lot of people are aware of following a low protein diet to help with their kidney function and protect their kidneys. Yeah, and I've noticed personally that if I eat more plant-based, especially that week before labs, my BUN, BUN goes down. But if mm -hmm. I eat, like if I have a ribeye, you guys have heard me earlier this week, 
talked about how much I missed my ribeyes. I never got one. Um, if I have something like that a couple days before my labs, boom, my BUN is always up. It's amazing how much or how quickly my diet can impact my BUN. Now, I've never gotten it all the way back to normal, but I've gotten it pretty close, and that's whenever I'm really good with my diet and I'm, I'm sticking with a plant-based diet, I can get it really close to normal. Mm -hmm. All right, next one, the one that we kind of mentioned earlier, creatinine. So creatinine is something that I think people, of course, are really going to focus on when it comes to kidney health. Um, what I think that people sometimes misconstrue is thinking that creatinine will be influenced by the diet and indirectly there might be some relation there, but in a direct, in a, in the most direct way, creatinine is related to muscle metabolism. Yes. Yeah. Building and breaking down of your muscles. So that is really where the creatinine is being measured is from that muscle metabolism, meaning it's not necessarily your diet, maybe some lifestyle factors. It can be related to diet if you're not getting adequate nutrition and your muscles are being broken down because you're uh, mal malnourished, essentially. In that case, maybe. But it's really, this is what's measuring the kidney function of that waste collecting in the blood. Mm -hmm. So typically we're looking at creatinine between about 0.84 to 1.21 and it can vary for a lot of different reasons even like bodybuilders can have higher creatinine um the black community uh, typically is seen as having a higher lean body mass meaning higher creatinine although i am really really curious about that and i'm researching it more because um that we could go down on another whole wormhole yeah. with that but um it's very interesting to look at and it, it really, really can vary significantly. Now, if you have kidney damage and kidney health issues, your creatinine can range anywhere from two to like 15. You can have high creatinine levels because of the way the kidneys aren't able to quite manage and balance the creatinine. And this can be normal in a kidney world sense. So what we want to look at are the other health conditions. And again, big picture, looking at that trend, where is it going? What is it looking like for you? So that I think is one of the most important things to realize with kidney health and kidney health issues is that, uh, diet has some things to do with kidney health creatinine. I mean, there was a study that I was looking into that showed eating meat prior to the blood draw did show that creatinine was a little bit higher. Um, but in general, it's not typically what we're seeing. So it really has to come from what's again, causing the kidney issues and addressing that root cause mm -hmm. to help ease that stress from the kidneys. Yeah. And when I was first diagnosed, of course, I'm like, doctor, I got to get all my numbers normal. And he said, the number one number I want you to completely ignore is creatinine because you're not going to be able to impact that. We've got to get everything else within range. Get your, you know, all my, my D, everything else. Focus on those things because I could influence those with diet and lifestyle changes fairly, fairly quickly, relatively. And mm -hmm. he said, your creatinine will just come along as you start getting healthy. And there's only so far you can go. And he also had me ignore my BUN in the beginning because it, was, it wasn't too high. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that things are all good, I feel that I'm able to better keep my BUN from being too high. I haven't mm -hmm. been able to get it back to normal, but I, I'm definitely not letting it get back to 80 and stuff like that, like it had been before. Um, we have a question here, and I do not know the answer to this. Can exercise lower creatinine if I do the right, or right amount, not too much? Do you know if that could help? So this kind um, of building mass or toning. Yeah, that's a good question. I would need to look into more research behind that. Uh, with, like I had mentioned before, bodybuilders, people that doing are doing a lot of weightlifting exercises, like heavy weightlifting. With heavy weightlifting, you're breaking your muscles down, rebuilding them back up. So there's more creatinine fluctuations there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when we talk about exercise, like a lot with a lot of my clients, one of the focuses is really often just like walking 
You know, we talked about that 10,000 oh, steps a day. It's my favorite exercise. Yeah, yeah. And something like that is going to be not as uh, creatinine influenced or, or will not influence creatinine as much. Uh, I can't I can't say it's it's going to directly improve creatinine. Again, just like just like James Doctor said, like we're not looking at creatinine. This is a separate thing. This is measuring how the kidneys are doing. Mm -hmm. This is telling us what's going on. This is not this is the really the the result of the work. The other ones are the what you can tweak to yeah. get some results. So I I wouldn't I wouldn't associate it directly with that, but that could be a good question for the doctor. Great. All right. Next one. And I may mispronounce some of these. Albumin. You got it. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, I, I got, oh, what, what is the EPO? Epipoitin? Oh, uh, I can't remember. Some of them I get. I have to practice them. Yeah. <laughs> but that one, there we go. So what, actually, I don't even know. What the heck is albumin? I've never had a problem with mine. Yeah, so albumin is a serum protein that is found in your body, and it's really a good measurement of inflammation. Old school thought was that albumin would tell us about nutrition. And I even remember in dialysis, if I had somebody with a low albumin, we used to think they're not eating enough protein. And so that's when the doctor would come in and say more meat, more meat, more meat. And they'd say, like, I'm eating steaks every meal. I'm eating eggs. I'm so sick and tired of meat. I cannot take any more. And we're thinking, you know what? If they're eating so much, why is their albumin still low? And it really started this research and more uh, looking into what's going on with the albumin. And what was found is that it's really not, not typically related to nutrition. It's related to inflammation. So it is basically... Uh, something that will decrease when you have more inflammation. So it goes the opposite way. Mm -hmm. So the more inflammation you have, the lower your albumin may be. Albumin typically is between 3.4 to 5. And it is something that we look at to, again, give us an idea of, is there inflammation going on? What's happening in the body? It doesn't tell us what exactly is happening. It's just a clue as to there's something going on here that needs to be fixed. Yeah, very good. And I have a question that popped up right here. Carolyn asks, what influences or shows what stage you are in? That is a calculation called the GFR or EGFR that is based on the creatinine. As a matter of fact, let me, let me show you, for those of you that are new, here's one of the portals with some of my labs. And if I go in here to my renal function, you can see there's sodium. There's some of the things there. Look, there's my BUN, 28. Oh, that's, I love that, 28, the lowest. Here's my creatinine, 2.25 when I had these tests done. And down here is the GFR. Now this is an E, so it's an estimated using a formula. And this is if I was African-American, this is non-African-American, so my GFR when I last did my test was a 33. And here's a lot of the things that we are talking about right now. And I'm so happy mine all are in a great range. So hopefully that answers your question, Carolyn there. And let me bring us both back up here on the screen. Whoop. Next one. Oh, one that we all have to watch. And I kind of feel it's kind of easy to watch. Sodium. Yeah, sodium. This is a good lab to be aware of. And I think it's something that can be really misconstrued oftentimes if your sodium is out of range. So the range we typically look at is 135 to 145. But if it's outside of the range, it doesn't necessarily mean just your sodium is at fault. It is measuring also the, uh, I guess the, what's the term for it? Um, not dilution, but basically how much is in your blood. And mm -hmm. if it's on the lower side, it could be diluted. If it's on the higher side, the concentration. There we go. Yep, there we go. That's it. So it's really measuring the most common particle that's in our blood to make sure that we have enough of it in there. And it's really, really closely related to your fluid balance and your blood pressure. Yes. So if you're looking at your sodium and you have a concern about that, talk with your doctor about what is going on 
non-diet related first, non-diet related, what's going on to cause this to be out of range. Even doctors sometimes will say, oh, eat more salt or eat less salt. And it's really not that simple. If it was, that would be awesome, but, but it's not. <laughs> so it, it's really important to think about your blood pressure. If it's running high, if you have edema or if you have that fluid retention, that's going to dilute your sodium level. So looking at those different factors to make sure that is not impacting what that lab result is looking like. Mm -hmm. So it is something to be really, really careful about. And don't just assume if your sodium is low that you should be eating more salt. I think that is a, a misconception that some people think of and they, fig they figure, oh, I get to eat more salt. And it's like, it's, it's almost like having a low blood sugar if, for someone who has diabetes and thinking yeah. they need to drink a soda to compensate for that low blood sugar. And then it just goes the other way. And then it's yeah. super high. It overshoots. So, exactly. Yeah. So that's a very similar kind of situation here when we talk about the sodium with, uh, with your salt intake. Yeah. And for those of you out there, you know, sodium also when you start, you know, you get the swelling um, your fluid level, your doctor may put you in a fluid restriction. There's a few questions in here about fluids. Um, we talked about, I think last week, the mm -hmm. only person who would give you a fluid restriction is your doctor. Make sure you don't restrict your fluid unless your doctor does that. And the standard amount of fluid to drink, there's a standard formula. It's half an ounce per pound. So if you weigh 150 pounds, you would drink about 75 ounces of water a day. That's kind of a general guideline. Your doctor or your dietitian can look at where you live, if you're out in the heat, if you're exercising a lot, other conditions, and give you the amount that you should drink. Uh, don't go out on Facebook and say, oh, here's a number right here. I'm going to drink that. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, this person, their GFR is similar to mine. They're on a restriction, so I'm going to restrict it. Don't do that. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. And that sodium level plays a big part or plays a role in if there is a water, a fluid restriction for you. All righty. Next one we have, and, and I love, the thing I love about sodium is that most stuff is labeled. So it makes it fairly easy to track using an app once you know um, how much you need and, and a target not to go over. Also, it can be dangerous to over restrict sodium. I made that mistake in the beginning. My doctor said, cut sodium. I cut it. I tried to hit zero. Mm. I ended up That's with, impossible. I know. I know because eggs, everything has sodium. And I was like, but yeah. I got so low. And let me tell you, it was, it was miserable because sodium is in everything and it got too low and then i was like whoa 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 now we got a big problem you went from too high to too low it's just as bad going too low all right next one this is one that i see a lot of people not really paying attention to they don't talk much about it but i had to pay attention to this in the beginning calcium yes uh i I love talking about calcium and the whole thing with the bone health. That was a really, really big part as my job as a dietitian in dialysis. And it's still a, something that's very important to me when it comes to kidney health. Calcium is something that's really, really important. It is the number one mineral that is stored in our body. And it's primarily in our bones. But it's something that really also has to do with even like muscle contractions. So it's something that we really want to pay attention to. Typically, calcium levels are about between 8.5 to about 10 or so. Um, and with kidney issues, it can really go either way. Uh, it can become really, really low or it can become really high. And again, this goes back to everybody's different. And just because you and your neighbor or your friend or somebody else also has kidney issues, your labs may not look the same. You, you could have a low calcium. They could have a high calcium. And it, it means different things and it's showing that there's differences in your kidney health. Yep. So oftentimes uh, for people with kidney issues, sometimes it is common for people to think about doing supplements. And something that I really warn about is calcium supplements because even with calcium that is out of range, there's other factors involved regarding why the calcium is out of range. So 
uh, actually the, the kidney disease uh, international outcomes, guidelines and outcomes, um, Cadigo, they do not recommend calcium supplements as a first line of defense. So it was it used to be very common that there would be medications that had calcium in them that would be prescribed to people with kidney issues, and they found that that was too much calcium, and the kidneys were having a difficult time in managing that, and it can lead to something that's called calcification, which means it's hardening your soft tissues. And if you experience a, a lot of generalized itching, you don't have allergies, it's something that's kind of come up randomly, it might, might, might <laughs> be related to your calcium balance or your phosphorus, which is also something that is tied in there. So be careful when it comes to your supplements, especially related to calcium, only follow what is prescribed by your doctor and what's being really monitored and um, regulated in that sense, because it's not something that you should just go like, oh, well, my calcium is looking on the low side. I better go add some calcium to my supplements. Not really the safest way. Yeah, do not self-prescribe Mm -hmm. supplements always check with your renal dietitian your doctor before you do that believe me guys i've been there i see stuff like oh i'll just order this on amazon i'll start taking it i'll fix that problem mm -hmm. they need to know first of all that there is a problem because the cause what caused it and you know you may just be masking it and then it's not going to help you in the long run all right here's one of the ones i dislike the most phosphorus um i like it i this is another like nerdy thing for me <laughs> that i i i enjoy like phosphorus it's a whole big thing and um i i think it's very interesting especially with like the newer research that's coming out and a different perspective when it comes to renal nutrition uh -huh. uh, but phosphorus is uh, the second highest mineral that's found in the body also stored in the bones and it does a lot of things for our body. It is part of our cell wall structure. It's part of our bones. It's what we use for our energy. It helps with vitamin usage in our body, muscle contractions, all of that stuff. Phosphorus is very important. Generally, people are looking for phosphorus but to be between 2.5 to 4.5. With kidney issues, they might have a slightly different range. And that could be somewhere between 3 to 5 because it is well known that the body has a harder time in regulating phosphorus. And so there is a, uh, a, a little bit of flexibility, I'll say, in that. So about three to five, you might see that on your lab results of the range that you're looking for. So either 2.5 to 4.5 or three to five. Either way, the goal is still to keep it in that general range for it to be the safest for you. Uh, so it's something that we still want to be focused on when it comes to diet. We talk about phosphorus additives, things that are put into our foods that are absorbed at a very, very high rate. Uh, so phosphorus is one of the things that actually is really, really big when it comes to diet and food choices. And it can be supremely influenced by what you're eating, mm -hmm. whether it is going through the fast food drive through all the time, or if it's doing whole foods, or if it's doing canned foods combination thereof. It doesn't matter. It's all really heavily influenced by the diet. And that is probably one of the top things I would say working with a dietitian, you will be able to really determine and figure out how to balance whether it's with just the diet or diet with medications. Um, either way, it's something that can be really well managed. And it's important to take care of it because if phosphorus goes uncontrolled, it is one of those, um, it's one of those things that it can kind of get away from us and it might be high for a while and we don't feel anything. We don't notice any problems, but eventually it's basically hardening the inside. It's hardening, hardening the arteries. Um, I had a horror story when I first started in dialysis of a, a dialysis patient who got called to transplant and he was really excited, was going to go get a kidney transplant went to the hospital, got into surgery, woke up to find out he couldn't get a kidney transplant oh. because, yeah, his phosphorus had been high for so long, it actually hardened the arteries of the kidney and they were not able to put that kidney in. Oh. And so, I mean, can you imagine waking up thinking you're going to get a new kidney and waking up and realizing that you didn't get a kidney? Yeah. 
Oh, oh, that would yeah. be heartbreak. For me, phosphorus was probably the single most difficult thing to get under control in the beginning because mm -hmm. it's in so many of the foods that I was accustomed to buying. I, you know, I, you open my pantry, there's stuff in there that says eat before pretty much three, the year 3000 or something, you know, it has that ultra long shelf life and just loaded with all sorts of PHOS, FOS, 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 all the different versions mm -hmm. of it. Uh, it took me a while to get mine under control. And it's one of those ones where I never went too low. Some of my things I went too low. I cut too much in the beginning. Uh, it was one of those ones that was always high and now it's, it's good, you know, but it, it, it took me a while to figure out to how to keep an eye out for it on those ingredients. Cause it's one of those things yeah. that whew, it's in a lot of things and in a lot of different versions. Now kind of partnering with phosphorus, the other thing a lot of us keep an eye on potassium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So potassium is the third most abundant mineral in the body. And it is an electrolyte. It helps with our nerves. It helps with our muscles again. It helps with our fluid balance. It helps with blood sugars. It helps with a lot of things. So in general, potassium is going to be about between 3.5 to 5. And it's something to definitely keep an eye on. Your doctor, that's probably one of the things that your doctor will hyper like focus in, ooh, focus in on right away. When it comes to your labs, they're going to look at your GFR and then your potassium. Uh, because those are the things that need to be monitored really when it comes to uh, your safety and your kidney health. Because high and low potassiums can actually stop your heart. So it can cause cardiac arrest because of the way that it reacts with or because of the way it acts as nerve conduction and muscle contraction. I mean, our heart is a muscle. If we don't have enough potassium or if we have too much potassium, it can basically do the equivalent of sticking a fork into an outlet. It's going to override the system and it's, it's very important to be aware of when it comes to your potassium. So if you have issues with your potassium balance, this is again a place where working with a dietitian can help in addressing not only the diet aspect of foods, but also looking at other factors, including your lifestyle and your medications, which can play an important part in your potassium balance. Yeah, and I, I I just pulled up one of my older labs. This is after the ER when I was in the ICU. And there is my potassium. It's not high. It was actually dangerously low at 2.8. Um, and they gave me two bags via IV of potassium uh, in the ER. So this is after I had some added to me. Uh, boy, look at that creatinine. Oh, Boy, I, I rarely go back and look at these old things, but it's a lot of times we think of our potassium as just being too high, but it can right. be too hot, too low. Now, I believe part of my reason was because I have heart issues um, and I had an episode due to the high blood pressure and all that um, when I first got to the ER. Uh, but yeah, mine was 2.8. This is the lowest mm -hmm. 3.5. Oh, all right. So here's one that I think a lot of people accidentally think they can artificially supplement and it will help them. And this is one of the ones that just drives me nuts when I see YouTube videos promoting this as some kind of a cure and encouraging people to just start taking it all by themselves. Sodium bicarbonate. Yeah. So there's bicarbonate. Uh, you might also see it as carbon dioxide on your lab report. And this is related to your pH balance, your acid base balance. And that's something that the kidneys help take care of with the body. So with kidney issues, the body tends to lean towards a more acidic side, which lowers the bicarbonate. And we want to look for bicarbonate to be about 20 to 28, 29. Um, but again, with kidney issues, it can go below 20. And that's where the doctor might recommend or prescribe you sodium bicarbonate tabs or sometimes baking soda. Mm -hmm. And uh, baking soda is recommended sometimes if there's like a cost issue related to the medication. But we've talked about it before. Baking soda is so high in sodium. So, mm -hmm. so high in sodium. 
So imagine you're playing whack-a-mole and you hit one mole down and then two more pop up. And that's something when you're self-prescribing that you're trying to do. Um, I've had clients who even stopped their sodium bicarbonate against medical advice and they saw their labs, their sodium bicarb go back down. Then they restarted it and it came back up again and it was fine. So these are prescribed medications for a reason. They are there to support your kidneys, your health. So make sure you're following the directed prescription because the doctor is really regulating that. And the doctor is relying on you to follow that prescription. They're going to be looking at your labs and saying, okay, so the sodium bicarbonate must be working, or maybe we need to increase the dose. If you're not following that prescription, you're not giving the doctor reliable information that they can then use and looking at, looking at the labs to determine what the next step is. So make sure, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, make sure that you're following the prescription and that you're not uh, like James said, self-prescribing, self-diagnosing. It's not going to help. It could be harmful. It could be harmful for you and cause more problems. And how bad would you feel to think that you tried something thinking it would help, but then to go in and get the exact opposite results? Yeah. And I see so many other YouTube channels promoting self-medicating with baking soda um, as a cure. It is not a cure. If you need some sodium bicarbonate, your doctor will tell you doing it on yourself is not helpful and it could cause problems. So be real careful Mm -hmm. out there. And the people who are promoting that, they're just trying to get you to click on it so they can run tons of ads and make a little bit of money. They don't care Mm -hmm. about your health. They don't care one bit. Otherwise they wouldn't be promoting that. All right, the next one, and I used to be really good at saying this. I'm gonna try to say it. Parathyroid hormone. Yeah, you got it. Got it. You got it. So parathyroid hormone or abbreviated PTH is something that's measuring a hormone that balances your calcium and phosphorus levels. Now with kidney disease, there is an imbalance of this hormone. It tends to climb higher and higher. And this is related to the kidneys not recognizing that the calcium levels are okay or not noticing there might be a decrease in your vitamin D levels. Uh, there are some things there. There's just basically a disconnect. There's these all these conversations that are supposed to be happening in the body, and with the damaged kidneys, some of these conversations aren't going through. So the PTH is something that's going to be monitored, typically uh, later stages, and into end stage on dialysis up to monthly, but usually it's every one to three months or so. It's it's a, a very slow moving metric. It's not something you're gonna get really instant results on. Uh, in general, we're looking at about 10 to 65, but it can go upwards of 10 times as high as that with kidney issues. Yes, so it's something that another one of those that we expect to be a little more out of range, but again, it comes down to the trend. Where is this trend going? What is it looking like? And are we doing everything that makes sense in the safest in the safest way to manage that so it might be related to medications if it becomes very very uh high and uncontrolled there is a option for surgery so some people do have surgery to remove the parathyroid hormone parathyroid hormone. Um, it's actually just so you know, it's these glands that are in your neck. So everyone's Mm. familiar with thyroid. Yeah. 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 Everyone knows of thyroid. Parathyroid is something that's in front of the thyroid. So it's these four glands that are in front of the thyroid and this is what's pumping out the PTH and this disconnect. I could talk about this for like the whole time. I swear. Um, <laughs> Just be careful. We only got 15 minutes left. I know. I know. I know. This is like one of my favorite things, though. It ties with phosphorus. Uh, but the it's really it just pumps out more hormone, and it's kind of like the thought of seeing a muscle get stronger and stronger that it gets bigger and bigger. So some people with really high PTH levels might have a little bit like larger looking um, bumps on their neck. Or you might see somebody that has a scar on their neck from a surgery where they had their PTH or their parathyroid removed. So uh, it can lead to surgery oftentimes. And this is after like years of it being uncontrolled and getting high. I had patients with PTHs in the three, five thousand. So very, very high levels. And when it's that high, it's a very, very high risk of breaking down your bones because that hormone is looking for calcium. And where is our calcium stored? 
Yeah. Well, I just looked mine up. It was 58. Okay. That's it. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next one. Now, this is one that I pay a lot of attention to. For some reason, it's very important to my doctor, vitamin D. Yeah. So vitamin D is a, uh, once we get it into the body and it goes through this processing essentially in our body, it's converted to a hormone. And part of that processing requires the kidneys. So again, with kidney health issues, there's this disconnect that the vitamin D isn't getting processed and you don't have enough of that active vitamin D in your body. So we measured the vitamin D levels and the goal is to keep them above 30. Below 30 is a low vitamin D and that puts you at a high risk of fractures and bone breaks because it's not helping to balance that calcium. So we're looking for at least 30. There's Something really, really important here is the dosing of vitamin D. And I know we've talked about like supplements mm -hmm. even in this episode and other ones too, but there's different amounts of vitamin D dosing. Another thing you should not really be self-prescribing because there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. And if you're taking a high amount, it can lead to uh, over, uh, over absorption of calcium and the body can only hold so much calcium, so it still leads to that calcification. So be careful with how much you're taking. And I really, I always recommend to my clients, anybody who's taking a vitamin D supplement, number one, tell your doctor that you're taking it. Mm -hmm. Number two, make sure that you're getting uh, your vitamin D levels checked. I recommend at least three to six months, especially if you're on a higher dose. And I consider a high dose to be above 10,000 IUs, international units. Uh, if you're taking more than that, than that a day, uh, then that is going to be something that you should get checked and make sure that you're at the right appropriate dosing. Yeah, um, and that's something my doctor tweaks quite often on mine. Every time I go in, they always check the vitamin D. For some reason, and it's worked, they want me mm -hmm. to be in an 80. That's where they wanted me to get to. Um, for one nephrologist wanted a 50. And the other one wanted an 80 and the one I trust, we went with 80 and they discussed it. And I am on a fairly high dose, but every so often mm -hmm. I'll go in and they'll say, okay, we're going to cut it in half. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to do, and, and by, by a large dose, I take 100,000 units a week, not a day. Mm -hmm. um, and they may cut it to 50 or say a 50 and a 10. So it's only 60,000 a week. Uh, but they, they keep a real good eye on my vitamin D. Um, yeah. And I'm guessing it's to keep my bones healthy. All right. Yeah. Here, here's one that um, very common. Your A1C. Yes. So if you have blood sugar issues, if you have a history of diabetes, then you might be familiar with A1C. Uh, the long name term for it is hemoglobin A1C, or you might see abbreviated as HGBA1C on your labs. And this is a measurement of how much sugar has been circulating in your blood over the course of two to three months. Mm -hmm. This is another slow moving metric. You're not going to get huge changes if you get it tested more often than every three months. Uh, not likely, at least, unless it's very uncontrolled, and then you might see some changes there. But basically, it's measuring how much sugar is stuck to the outside of your cells because it's been accumulating there over the course of this two to three month time period. So you want to aim for, if you have blood sugar control issues, aiming for below 7% is a good thing to strive for. And oftentimes when doctors see your A1C at or below seven, they're gonna say everything looks good, fine, no need to change anything. Because it's at a good range of being controlled. I know we've talked about labs wanting to get them more tightly controlled before. And sometimes it's not always as helpful to get them too tightly controlled when I'm talking about A1C because there needs to be some flexibility there. Uh, otherwise, it can be um, kind of shocking for the body to go through things like that. So having about seven is a realistic goal for people with blood sugar issues. So make sure you're talking with your doctor about the different factors related to your blood sugar control whether it's related to your other health issues and inflammation, it's related to your diet, ask for a referral to a dietitian, or if it's related to your lifestyle choices, looking at making some lifestyle choices to help use the blood sugars that you're putting in the body. Yeah, and um, 
as far as the A1C goes, this is where if your doctor says you're pre-diabetic, that means you're kind of getting a bit on the high side and you need to work on getting yours down. I was, I remember at one of them, they said, or actually at several of them, you're pre-diabetic. My last one, 5.9. Oh, so happy. And you can't trick an A1C. Because nope. it's looking at that sugar that's on your cells, and it's about two to three months of you being on your diet and being healthy. If you made a trip to Krispy Kreme and you you, you wolf down a dozen donuts, it's going to show up. You can't mm -hmm. trick it. <laughs> no, you cannot. That is one of the almost foolproof labs, I would say, that you yeah. cannot get around. It's going to tell. It's going to be very blunt with you, no matter what. And there's no prep. I, I'll just be in there. Yeah. Like, oh, I want an A1C here. Come over here. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like go home and, and fast and come back tomorrow or in three right. days or anything like that. Right. Try to prep they, for it. Yeah. They just jump you. They get you. We're getting in now. I'm going to see yeah. what you did. All right. <laughs> next one. Next test. So all of those are blood tests that we've done. What about the urinalysis? So uh, the urinalysis is really, if we think about what the kidneys are doing, it is measuring, the kidneys are getting rid of waste through filtration by the urine. So a urinalysis is going to see what is in your urine, what the kidneys are eliminating, whether it's something good, something bad, how much of it is being eliminated. So it's really going to give us an idea of the back end, the, the out processing of what the kidneys are doing. So it's really helpful to get the urinalysis. Again, it's a measurement to give us an idea of what's going on, but it's a part of the picture. Mm -hmm. Again, it's it's not something related directly, or it's not something that you can just look at only that and say, um, I now I know everything, and now we know exactly how to proceed. And it is it is a part of the function. So the reason we're covering these different things, blood and urine. Mm -hmm is to show the before and the after, if we're looking at basically how the kidney is taking care of things. So with the urinalysis, we're looking the, at what the kidney has gotten rid of, looking to see what is there should be there, and if something shouldn't be there, you know, why it's not there, looking more into that. Um, but urinalysis is something that's important to make sure that you have checked uh, at a frequency determined by your nephrologist or your urologist, which we haven't talked too much about. Yeah, and, and I would say it's very important if you're taking, uh, if, you're, if they're going to go in, you're going to pee in the cup. Um, I would call your doctor if you're taking like a multivitamin and ask them about that. When should I take it? Because if you take something that has a lot of the B vitamins, mm -hmm. your pee is going to be super yellow. And the color is one of the things they kind of look at. And they'll, they'll know <laughs> that it's got too much. They'll see that there's B in there. Um, but it, it's best to find out. So I whenever I go in, if I'm going to, do a urine test. I don't take any multivitamins until I take my regular med, my blood pressure medicine, but I don't take the multivitamins till after. That way I'm not flushing my, my bladder with all this excess B vitamins and things like that, that will turn it yellow. All right, let's jump in. So we're getting real close to time and AA, we're going to answer your question. We have something for you in just a moment. Lipid panel. We actually had some people asking about this one a little bit earlier. Okay, so lipid panel is another one that I think is really, really important that tells us another side of the story. And you might be thinking, oh, you know, my, my fats are fine. Like, what does this have to do with our kidney health? Well, one of the things I find that a lot of people with kidney issues have is they automatically get prescribed a statin, statin medication. And this is something that is seen as potentially protective. My, uh, what I always put back to people when it comes to the statin is talking with your doctor about what's the plan for this medication and what are, what do we need to look at in regards to taking this medication because it is meant to lower your cholesterol level. So lipid panel is important to be checking on if you're taking medication that could affect your cholesterol levels. So for one, uh, we want to make sure that cardiovascular disease related to the lipid panel is being monitored because heart issues are one of the top causes of death when it comes to kidney health or kidney issues because of the impact and the connection between the kidney and the cardiovascular system. Think of blood pressure and risk of heart attack and stroke, all of that kind of stuff. So it's all really tied together and getting your lipid panel done at least once a year, if not more frequently, can be good, really helpful insight. Yep, very, very good. And now 
We are almost at the top of the hour. Look, we are staying right on track. We are flying know, through it, though. Us. We're yeah. flying through this. I knew, I knew <laughs> this was going to be so much information, and it was going to be really hard to capture in just one hour. It, really impossible, to be honest. But, hey, we did a good job at it. Yep. And here's a question. Where can we go to find out what each of these can be? Is there a chart? A perfect question. I did not plant this. So what do we have on your blog, which I will put a link in the description of the video once this is all done. What do you got for us? Well, um, I took some time in the research, making sure that I wanted to get all these questions answered for you guys. So I do have a blog post, a new blog post up on my website. So you can go check that out. It is the labs to track. So all the numbers that we've gone through, we talk about the ranges that you want to look for, how the kidneys might impact it or what those ranges, how they might differ. So it's going to be know your numbers, the renal function panel and more because we know there's more. But also with that is a free download that you can get. And it is a PDF, a one page printout of a lab tracker that you can use to look and really start to follow. We common thread here in this conversation is look at the big picture. Exactly. Look the trends. At how See the every, trends. Yes. Look at the trends. So I created this tracker, this one page tracker that you can download for free and you can take this to your doctor's office. You can track your labs and really start to look at those numbers and look how things are progressing from result to result. Yep. And then one, and I'll put links to this all below the video. Uh, but it's on jenhernandezrd.com. It's on your website. Um, one last thing I like to throw in before we run out of time. Um, a lot of people are worried about drinking the right amount of water, being hydrated, or they think, oh, maybe if I overhydrate, it'll help my labs. They kind of want to game the labs. I don't know why you'd want to game them. We want to know what no. they're really doing. But let me tell you, here's what my doctor told me. Dehydration can influence my labs by up to 20%. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh, that's not good. And trying to drink a whole bunch of water, guzzling it right before you, you, you go in and get your labs, is it gonna do you anything? It takes at least 45 minutes before this gets starts getting absorbed into your system. My doctor says, drink normally, sip, stay hydrated and get your labs. Don't try to game the system. You're not doing anything but cheating yourself. And chances are you're going to end up dehydrated because you're going to not drink. And then you're going to try to guzzle a whole bunch of it minutes before you go in there to get your labs done. So, yeah. And I had somebody on, I had somebody on my watch party on Facebook ask, well, what about a low BUN? Is mm -hmm. that harmful? And one of the, one of the things that can happen if you have a low BUN is maybe you were overhydrated and you diluted the BUN levels. Mm -hmm. So, you really want to make sure that you talk with your doctor when you're prepping for labs, understanding what fasting means about when to stop eating, what what you should be having as far as water before the labs. Again, don't be guzzling a whole lot of water thinking that you're going to help your labs. It's cheating on a test. And you really want to get a good test result from this. And a good Except, test I result want an accurate, an accurate one. I want to know how I'm oh, really <laughs> doing. Yeah. I don't want to game thought, yeah. it and get the numbers that look better when I'm really not there. Mm-hmm. Right, right, because right, it's not going to do anything to help you if it's false. <laughs> and look at, we are right at the exact top of the hour. We made it <laughs> perfect down to the moment. All right, everybody, I know this was a full hour. I know it went by so fast. You're going to have a lot of questions, but there will be links in the description. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube if you haven't subscribed already. And there'll be more videos tomorrow. And then Jen is, is here again next Tuesday. And I can't remember what our topic is, but it's always awesome, great stuff. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And I will see you guys in the next video.